anybody ready for the word today? No, no pageantries today. No announcements. I got to preach. Get your Bibles out. Get your notepads out. I have been infused with another level of faith. Somebody asked me, they said, what week are you on in that series? Crazy faith. I said, we're going to be crazy till Christmas. So today I'm excited to announce to you that we are in week 10 of a series we're calling Help Me Crazy Faith. And, and, and I, I want you to know that this, this message is reverberating around the world. I, I, was, I had the opportunity to be with a lot of pastors that are influencing the world this week. And, and it's crazy that the first thing that all, all of them came up to me and said was how this series is inspiring their faith to believe God on another level. Now, these are leaders of some of the largest churches in America. And they're saying, what y'all are doing at, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, what you're doing in that, it's causing us to believe God like never before. One person told me that they literally have church on Sunday, and then they sit their whole staff down to watch our sermons on Monday. Y'all, do y'all want to transform the world or not? Come on, y'all. The reason I'm telling you this is because I want you never to take lightly what God has us sitting in. It is a move of God, and he doesn't want it to be a move for our church. He wants it to be a move for your life. So today, I think we're going to go one step further in this series, and um, I want to read um, the Bible today. Now, now, I say it just that plainly because there will be many churches that people go to today that they won't even read the Bible. Do you know how dangerous that is? This is not self-help or, or, or a, an inspirational talk. <laughs> What we're trying to do is get you changed from the inside out. And that only happens through the word of God. It's the only book that you can read and it reads you. It's the only book that I'll be saying something, the Holy Spirit cutting you up on something totally different. And today I want us to read the Bible. And I'm going to read a large passage of scripture. We're going to go back from where we were last week. But I just ask us this one more time. Could we stand up for the reading of God's word in this place? I just want us to get used to being a church that loves the Bible and that reads the Bible even if it's not just the scripture. Social media and our daily Bible verse can, can, can make us substitute really diving into the word of God. And it would, be, it would be the equivalent of you eating a fruit snack every meal. If all you had was a fruit snack for every meal, breakfast, fruit snack, lunch, fruit snack, dinner, guess what it is, fruit snack. What you would be at the end of the, end of the night is hungry. No, you wouldn't be hungry. You'd be hangry. <laughs> Y'all know that's angry and hungry. May, may, may I suggest to you some of you spiritually are hangry. Because all you're doing is eating a fruit snack in the word of God. And what I'm challenging you to do, while I'm bringing this much word to you, I'm challenging you, everybody who's watching online, everybody who watches on the rebroadcast, to find yourself hiding in the word of God. Can I get one big amen? amen? Okay. So we're about to go to 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 5. And it's going to be on the screen. And when there's some underlined words, I want you to say that thing out with me, okay? It says, um, the Philistines mustered up a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. They camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in. And because they were hard pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. We, we learned about that last week. Um, some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. Meanwhile, everybody say meanwhile. meanwhile. Saul stayed at Gilgal and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there for seven days as Samuel, um, as instructed him earlier. But Samuel still didn't come. So Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering, say this word with me, himself. Woo, that's dangerous when you do stuff without God. Just as Saul was finishing up the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to meet him and welcome him. What up, Sammy? 
And he said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, see, what had happened was I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you was, and the Philistines were at Michmash, and they was ready to big bash. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked the Lord for help. How dumb of me. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command the Lord your God has given you. Had you have kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, 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 before you take your seat right now, is there something with the mic? Is, is, it, is it okay? Is it acting stupid? Here, give me, give me this, this too good. We can't have no distractions. They're coming? Amen. We're just going to wait. <laughs> well, ain't the title of this message, Hasty Faith. Now, now, last week we talked about not being able to wait. And just right now where we got to wait on somebody, some people got anxious. You ain't even up here in front of thousands of people and you anxious. But sometimes the Lord may cause us to have to do something in a season that it's in front of people. And you just have to, everybody say, wait. Uh-huh. And what I found out as I've been studying in this series is there's something that's happening right now. What we need? What you need? Can I turn it on? Check one, two. Can y'all hear me now? Okay. What I found out in this series is that Saul is about to be disqualified from the promise of God because he was too hasty. He moved too quickly. And I don't know who's in this, this room where there's a situation or a circumstance in your life where you've been trying to outpace God. And I know it's the stuff we don't talk about because what we want to do is do it and then act like God blessed it. No, we've been together this long and God is in this relationship. No, hold on, stop. You did that. And many of us are so hasty, but what I found out is that the reason that many of us are hasty is because of a word that is real popular in 2019, a, a word called FOMO. It, it's the fear of missing out. And a lot of us make hasty decisions because of the fear of missing out. And, and, and I want to let you know that this is not a new thing. This is the same thing that Saul was dealing with in, in his lifetime. He was dealing with the fear of missing out. Let me just show you a couple of pictures. Stay standing. I know y'all still standing. He's like, he forgot about us. No, I want you to see this. I, I want you to, everybody say, wait on me. Uh-huh. I'm going to do just like random awkward pauses all service. See, see, I, pictures of FOMO is like when you saw that there was a party and you wasn't going to go and then you saw what it looked like on social media and you go to your closet trying to find something to wear. It's not because you wanted to even go, but now you have the fear of missing out. See, some of y'all are dealing with FOMO in another area. Some of y'all go to the game and you've been wanting to leave since halftime. But you won't leave all my Texas fans because, oh, you beat you yesterday. <laughs> Boomer. Okay, okay, okay. We are in Oklahoma. But you wanted to leave since halftime, but you wouldn't for the fear of missing out. And some of y'all like, I don't even like sports, but you do like success. And so that's why you go to every business mixer there is trying to make the next contact so you don't miss the next big deal for the fear of missing out. FOMO makes us do things and sacrifice things that were never supposed to be sacrificed because we feel like if we can get in front of it, maybe we won't miss out on something. See, FOMO is like some of the sneaker heads in the room that there's a new drop and a new release and you will sleep outside for the fear of missing out on the new. 
I'm just in your business. And some of y'all are like, none of those apply to me, Pastor Mike. I, <laughs> I don't have FOMO. But you've dated everybody and their mama. Uh, for the fear of missing out on the, okay, Leo DiCaprio. He's dated 28 people and not married one of them. FOMO. Someone's like, well, he didn't date me. <laughs> what I need you to ask your neighbor, what I need us to examine is are you moving in, in, in haste because of the fear of missing out? Ask your neighbor, do you have FOMO? And you can take your seat. Come on, do you have FOMO? Ask two more people. Do you have FOMO? Okay, do you have it? <laughs> Some people being honest right now. Yes, I do, yes. <laughs> the quicker we can be honest with that, the better we'll, we'll be able to see what God may have for us. Because the difference between hazy faith and crazy faith is that you have to know that your time, your life, your family is in God's hands. And when you have fear of missing out on an opportunity or the next big thing or, or, or something that is to come, what you start doing is trying to make a way for yourself when God says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and, and many people in this room won't say it out loud, but you're dealing with, everybody say FOMO. FOMO. And, and I think that if I was to diagnose this, I, I would have to look at the definition of FOMO. And I'm going to go to one of the most credible sources in our time today, the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> and FOMO means the omnipresent anxiety brought on by our cognitive ability to recognize potential opportunities. Let me remix that. It's a lot of anxiety because of the potential of things that could happen. See, a lot of people right now are dealing not in the reality of what is happening. You are making moves based on what could happen. And so you start going because you could be single for the rest of your life. So you start doing things in haste off of the potential of what everybody say could. And this is what is happening in Saul's life, is he's about to forfeit the promise of God, not because of what did happen, but because of what could have happened. And he was moving in fear. And that's what I want you to know, just first off, that FOMO, FOMO is fear. Hasty faith has fear. Write that down. Hasty faith has FOMO. It... it I know it seems kind of uh, just elementary right now, but I'm going to build this whole thing out to where maybe you'll never look at your situation the same again. Hasty faith has the fear, the fear of missing an opportunity, the fear of going to the next place, the fear of what God might not do in the season that you want him to do it. And um, I think FOMO can have more than just the fear of missing out as a definition. And we're going to see that in Saul's life. Look at it. In um, chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Then the men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, we learned last week that that's his only play, is to hard-press you when you're in a tight spot. It said they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the Jordan and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. Write this down. Hasty faith has FOMO. What is FOMO, Pastor Mike? The fear of meeting opposition. See, many of you are running away from what God has called you to do because you have FOMO, the fear of meeting any opposition. And this is the very thing that made Saul offer the burnt sacrifice before it was time because he did not want to face this giant that was in front of him. And my question to you is what are you running from because you know when you face it, it's going to give you opposition. See, the problem with many of us is that our hasty faith won't allow us to go against the thing that we know we're going to have to stand and fight against. Do you think it was an accident that we sang the song, I'm going to see a victory? You cannot see a victory if you never show up to the fight. 
And there are too many people yelling that I'm going to see a victory, but you are afraid to go against any opposition. And that's what happened to Saul. See, running from opposition never allows you to overcome opposition. And many of you have never overcome anything, not because you can't, it's because you won't face it. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? There are many people in this room right now under the sound of my voice that need to go and face that family issue. <gasps> not that thing that we don't talk about. Not that thing that we all about to act brand new at Thanksgiving and Christmas. We, we don't want to bring that up. We don't want to talk about those things. But if you never face it, you never get to overcome it. And that's why there are people right here now running from pain. Do you see what they did after they found out that what they were hiding in would not sustain them or cover them? They ran to another land. Like many of us are running from job to job, place to place. We're running from person to person. And God's saying, hey, I've put in you the ability to face whatever the giant is that is in front of you. And if you're going to see the victory... You cannot have FOMO, the fear of meeting opposition. And some of y'all just punks. You scared. You scared that if you get out there in the name of God, he going to leave you hanging. You're scared that if you actually step out and do the thing and have the awkward meeting, that it's going to end awkward. Listen to me. The things that God has you going to and going through is not even for the outcome. It's for what it makes in you. And God is looking for obedience in his people like never before. And that's why Saul has FOMO. Because he was trying to figure out a way not to go through anything. How if I was to peer in on most of our prayers, all of us a lot of times are praying prayers that circumvent the trial. Like, Lord, if you could just make a way where I don't have to have that conversation with my boss about how he's treating me, and you would just kill him, Lord. Just take, I mean, I'll. <laughs> Y'all know how we do, Lord, if you, would just, if you would just allow these people to disappear. And God said, that's not how I work. My, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Oh, shoot. That means the opposition is not meant to take me out. The opposition is meant for me to overcome. But that means that I have to face it. And that's why when you run from friend group to friend group, you never get to overcome developing and being content in the community that God set you in. Y'all know that's why we do B groups. It's to help some of y'all on the run. The reason we ask you to get in community with people is because every time you mess up, you run to a new group that don't know what you used to go through. <laughs> and so you get to reinvent yourself in front of a new group of people who's like, no, she's perfect. And everybody else who really know you know you crazy and, and, <laughs> and know your habits and, and, and know your cycles. And it takes about eight months for you to go back into that same cycle that you used to be in. But you won't stay planted somewhere long enough. And you're afraid of the opposition. So you run somewhere else. But that's what hasty faith does. But crazy faith also has FOMO. Let me tell you. Crazy faith has faith of murdering opposition. Some of y'all are like, ooh, that's rated R, Pastor Mike. Oh, my God, rated R, murdering? <laughs> Let me help you. The thing that Saul did not conquer in this season, do you know what it was? It was a Philistine, which a Philistine is a giant. It was a group of giants, a family of giants. And because Saul did not obey God and defeat the Philistine, the next person that God had to raise up, his name was David. And do you know what David's opposition was? A Philistine, Goliath. These are the ancestors of Goliath are the people that Saul was supposed to take out. But because he had fear of opposition, the next generation had to now fight what should have been conquered in a previous generation, and they have to fight it in a mutated version. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? 
David now has to murder the thing his predecessor should have killed. My question to you is, what will your children have to murder that you should have killed? See, if you have crazy faith, you're going to say, no, I have the faith to murder my attitude. I have the faith to murder this poverty mentality over our family. I have the faith to actually murder this not dealing with issues. But you see, all of y'all are kind of like Saul. He, in another chapter, says, I'm okay as long as you bless me. My children will deal with their issues. But did y'all know we serve a generational God, a God, the, the father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. My question is, what are you leaving for the next generation to have to fight through? Because you didn't have the faith to go straight at it. Crazy faith says that it's time to kill these things that have been killing me. Not hasty faith runs from the opposition. But crazy faith says, you know what? I'm not going to let the next generation deal with what has kept me hiding and running. I don't know who this is for. I feel the presence of God in this place. But there are some people in this room that have been in a place where you have not done what God has called you to do because you have been running from your calling. I hear that so strong. You've been running not from a career, but your calling. And God is calling you out from the places, the rocks, the holes, the bushes that you've been hiding. And he said, it's time to meet opposition. But I've already given you, everybody say victory. victory. Pastor Mike, why, why are you staying on this point for such a moment? It's because I, I would rather you not come in here and get excited about something that could happen for you when you're fighting something in front of you that you keep running from. And I don't know who you are. I mean, literally, the Holy Spirit is telling me, stay here, Michael, because somebody's about to get it. There's somebody in this room that has had fear of meeting opposition. That's why you haven't filled out the application. That's why you didn't go ask for the loan. That's why you didn't present that song. That's why you didn't turn in the idea for the book. And God's saying to you today, he's saying, I have already given you, somebody shout at me, victory. victory. But that means you're going to have to face this thing. And Saul did not want to face it. I promise you, look what it said. It said, meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal and his men were trembling in fear. I want you to know, if you're going to be hasty and do things outside of the timing of God, fear is always the seed that is there. And when you have fear in your life, you allow that thing to grow and it makes you stop believing that God can do something in your life. Look what it says. It says, verse 8, Saul waited there for seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier. But Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Hasty faith. I want you to listen to this. Hasty faith has FOMO. It forgets orders and makes options. See, when you're moving in haste, it forgets what God tells you to do. And it makes up options that seem better at the time. This man had clear instructions from Samuel the prophet. Stay here for seven days until I come. And many of us, God has given instructions. Stay at this job until I tell you to move. Keep doing this until I give you further instructions. And when another opportunity comes up, a lot of us make decisions that are like, oh, well, this seems better. This seems more profitable. This makes more sense. And what ends up happening in this moment is when you are hasty, you have FOMO, you forget the, the things that God said and you make up your own options. Look what happens in this thing. He tells them, my men were rapidly slipping away. Can I give you a secret? When stuff is going away, don't start making decisions based off of what you lost. When you start making a decision based on the friends you lost, based on the money you lost, based on the things that have lost, you start doing things outside of the timing of God. And this man was supposed to wait on God for seven whole days, but he moved outside of the timing of God. But that's why crazy faith has FOMO as well. 
It follows orders and maintains obedience. See, a lot of us, we follow orders to a point, but we do not maintain the obedience when opposition and things start going away. And what I'm trying to give you is keys not to move outside of the timing of God. Stay obedient. Many of us want a brand new word from God. And God says, I'm not giving you a new word. I'm trusting you to maintain the last one I gave you. Uh, well, God, if you would just speak fresh, I did a new prayer and fasting time. And God said, I ain't giving you no new words. It was the last one I spoke. It was the last thing I said. I told you to take your wife on a date every week. She's been missing her dates. Do you hear what I'm saying? He said, I told you to do it every week. But now you're going through turmoil and you can't figure out why the passion is not there and the love is not there. And you say, God, will you save me? He said, I'm not giving you new instructions. I need you to maintain what I already told you to do. He told some of y'all to start a Bible study. And when people stopped coming, you stopped doing it. And he said, I'm not giving you new instructions. I need you to maintain the obedience that you had before. And that's why many of us are moving out of haste, like Saul. Because he had orders, but he didn't maintain it. Look what Galatians 6, 9 says. And this is my encouragement to every person in this room. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the, everybody say right time. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And I don't know who I'm talking to in this building right now, but you have been walking in a place where you've been forgetting the orders God said to you and you've been making up your own options. Some of y'all are in a city right now because you made that up. Some of y'all are in this church right now. Oh, well, you're going to lose membership. No, 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 no. See, I don't want you here if you're not supposed to be here. If you're negating an assignment that God called you to and there's an open spot somewhere else because you said, well, Transformation Church is cracking right now. They got a new building. Let me go over here. Get your disobedient butt up now. <laughs> And you need to go back to where you're supposed to be because your blessing is not in what's popping. Your blessing is, your blessing is where God's called you to. But some of y'all came to Transformation Church because of FOMO. The only reason you're here, now you're starting to sweat a bead right now. He gonna see me. He gonna see me. It's not for me. I'm just trying to get you in a place where your blessing is. Where your provision is. I'm gonna regret this message next week if half the people is gone. But all I'm telling you is, I gotta be obedient to what the word of God says. Not what benefits me in the moment. Y'all don't hear me. Hasty faith will have you out here making up stuff, making your own options. But crazy faith has FOMO too. It follows orders and it maintains obedience. Somebody said, I will maintain obedience. Look at verse 10, 1 Samuel 13, verse 10. I'm just walking you through some things of, of the FOMO that many of us have. It says, just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to meet him and welcome him. But Samuel said, what is this you have done? He said, I saw my men scattering from me, and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Migmash, ready to big bash. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's help. Watch this. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. Felt, that's feelings, compelled. Okay? Hasty faith has FOMO. Feelings over my obedience. I'm just trying to make this analogy work for you. Is that many of us have been in a place where I've put my feelings over my obedience. This man didn't get a word from God. This man just looked at the situation and he says, you know what? Let me consult my feelings right now. 
feelings, how do you feel? I feel scared. I feel lost. I feel like God's forgotten about me. Feelings, how do you feel right now? I feel like maybe if I do this on my own, God will somehow bless it. Feelings, what do you feel like right now? I feel overlooked at this job. I feel like nobody sees me. Feelings, what do you feel? I feel too fine to be single. <laughs> I feel too talented to be this broke. Feelings, what do you feel right now? I feel like I should have a bunch of friends, even though God called me to a season of separation. Feelings, what do you feel right now? I feel like I want to have sex with everybody. Your feelings are real, but they are a bad manager. If you are looking to your feelings to get instructions, you are headed for destruction. If you are looking to your feelings for instructions, you are headed for what? Destruction. This man is about to lose everything God had for him because he felt compelled. He talked to his feelings. Feelings, how do you feel? I feel like cussing everybody out and busting heads. Come on, let, let's be honest. Is it, isn't what gets us in trouble most of the time is letting our feelings go past our filter? Y'all know everybody got that line that don't push me across the line, bro. She said, period. You got that line. And then when you go past the line, when they keep nagging you, when they keep asking you, when they keep doing things, what we do is we turn our filter off. And our filter should be the word of God. Because it doesn't say I can't feel angry or feel like I want to bust some heads. But it says be angry and sin not. Dang it. But what ends up happening is many of us consult our feelings more than our faith. And this is the FOMO that led to Saul's demise. Is he put his feelings over his obedience. And I don't know who in this room... I'm talking to or watching online right now, but some of you, this is a sobering message. I'm a doctor today, and today is, I'm giving you anesthesia for your soul. This ain't the part where you're like, oh, I feel better yet. No, no, no. This is the part where you're saying, I, I think I feel it. I think it's starting to set in. That the reason I've been moving so fast is because I've been putting my feelings over the obedience God requires. Well, all my other friends are going to this college, so I feel like I should go there too. All my other, all the other people are getting plastic surgery around me. Y'all are laughing like that's not a real thing, but I can see you. <laughs> all I'm saying is feelings are a bad manager. And they'll disqualify you from the promise of God in your life. Hasty faith has FOMO, but crazy faith has FOMO too. Crazy faith says, I'm going to put my faith over my opinion. See, what ends up happening in this moment is that many of you have an opinion. How many people in this room have a very strong opinion on certain stuff? Come on, put your hands up in the air right now. Even watching online, strong opinion. My question is, when your opinion comes against your faith, which one wins? Oh, oh, I know. You have strong views on stuff. I could just start naming them and then this would turn into a real bad situation. But you got strong views on certain things. My question is what wins? What the word of God says? What is planted in your heart or your opinion? And, and, and what crazy faith says is my opinion loses every time. Y'all should see how tight y'all look right now. What happens if the sacrifice that God really wants for you is your opinion losing every time? Y'all know that's what happened to Jesus. When Jesus had an opinion in the garden before he was going to the cross, and he said, if there's any other way, I think this is dumb for me to have to go die for all of them. And half of them ain't even going to take it seriously. They're just going to put you on a chain around their neck. So, so I think this is dumb. That's my opinion. But what won? His opinion or his faith? He said, nevertheless, 
not my will or my opinion be done, let your will be done. My question is, in your life every week, what's winning? Is it your opinion? Well, I don't think you should have to tithe. That's my opinion. The church look like it's doing fine, huh? Is your opinion going to win? Or is faith going to win? Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't even think there's a problem. Problem with having sex before marriage. I mean, we know we're going to be together. We already living together. We eat together. She cooked for me. We got a cell phone plan together. I'm just in people's business right now. I'm sorry. But that is a sure way to, for your, never mind. Um, that may be your, everybody say opinion. It may be. But it's very clear in the word for us to save ourselves until we come into covenant with that one person. Because if not, it's going to be the ripping away of our souls over and over. And there's going to be a soul tie that then one day we're going to have to come to the altar and say, God, heal me. And he said, I was trying to protect you. God would rather protect you than heal you. He would rather keep you from it than have to go through it and then do surgery on you. But many times our opinion is over what faith says. Y'all going to cuss at me after this. I see it. Let me give you one more, one more thing because I need you to, I really need this to sink into your life. Verse 13, Samuel says, how foolish. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you have kept it. Had you have done it. Had you have been faithful. No matter how hard it was, had you have just stayed. The Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end. But the Lord has sought out of man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Hasty faith has FOMO. It fumbles obvious moments often. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? Saul has had, in his time of leadership, 42 years to get this one issue in his life right. A lot of people don't understand because we read the Bible in segments, but this happens and God lets him be the king over Israel for another 42 years. Now, if I was God and I told him, yo, junk ending today, I would have just beheaded him <laughs> and it would have been over right there. But this shows the difference between me and a grace-filled God. Yeah. Ah, some of y'all been so disobedient. Some of us have been moving out of the fear of missing out and the fear of making our own options and all of this other stuff. And you wonder why God keeps blessing. And you wonder why God keeps giving you opportunity. And what you're doing is you're taking the grace of God for granted. What you're saying is God's still blessing, so I guess he's okay with it. God's still good, so I guess this ain't a problem. I can keep living like this, and I think that this is okay. He's trying to give you an opportunity to change. Just like any good parent that is grace-filled, they tell you what they want you to do, but they have to give you an opportunity to turn or repent is the biblical word right here. And what he's doing for Saul is he's saying, this is your opportunity, 42 years of it, to turn from the way you've been doing stuff and turn to God. But what does Saul do? He fumbles obvious moments of God's grace often. Can, can I give you an example of it? <laughs> Look at it in 1 Samuel 15 verse 7. I'll have to paraphrase it. God tells him after this moment, hey, I'm still going to use you. Go kill the whole Amalekite army. Don't spare the king, the goats. Don't spare anything. Just kill everybody because they've sinned against me. Let's make this happen. What does Saul do? Saul says, well, I'll kill everybody except. Everybody say except. Yeah. Your except will get you messed up. He spared the king and he spared all the good animals so they, they could make a sacrifice to the Lord. Can, can, can you help me real quick? Uh, um, throw that to me real quick. Yeah, yeah, just go ahead. Go ahead. Ah! See, what happens is a lot of y'all are fumbling disobedience. 
You're fumbling and you're being disobedient. And so, so what happens is you catch a promise from God and you start walking and something comes and you fumble it. And God's literally saying, you're not even going back to try to pick it up. You're not even going back. This is what happened to Saul. He was disobedient. And what happens again? God gives him another opportunity. He sends somebody to fight his giant that he didn't fight. He sent David. David defeats Goliath, and he goes out and starts winning all these victories, and then he hears this sound. Saul killed his thousand. David killed 10,000. So what causes Saul to now abdicate his kingship and start chasing after David for the rest of his life? Let me tell you what it was. Throw it to me, bro. Come on. <sighs> Comparison. Comparison will make you fumble the opportunities God's given you. When you start looking at what their family is doing and what trip they just went on and what their church is doing, comparison will allow you to fumble the grace of God. The only reason he gave you another opportunity at that job was to give you an opportunity to submit and be humble again. But you made other options for yourself, so you fumbled that one too. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? All these examples are in old Old Testament, but can I give you a New Testament example of the things that will try to make you fumble the grace of God? Give it to me, bro. Come on. <sighs> opportunities. See, everybody thinks opportunities are good. Opportunities are only good if they're God. No, no. Can I prove it to you? I'm going to give you a testimony from the book of Michael, the sixth chapter, the ninth verse. Me and my wife have been going through an entire season of really dealing with this new level of attention. And at the same time, we've been dealing with the very real reality of our son MJ having autism and being able to get him therapy and do all these different things. And it's taken a toll on on our family, I get up here every Sunday and try to minister faith while I'm fighting opposition at home every week. Like, like every week. Anytime you're like, well, that, he could have done better. You don't even know what I dealt with that week. You, you have no clue what the enemy is trying to do behind the scenes to discourage, kill, and snuff out what God's doing up here. And so what God told me, he said, Michael, I'm going to need you to make a hard decision. I need you to take all the opportunities that I've afforded to you by the blessing that has been happening in the ministry. And I need you to cancel all your engagements from July to December. Don't go anywhere else. And I don't need you to take any more engagements. Hold on, God. That can't be you. That, that can't be you because cause, cause these are opportunities that are from God. These are opportunities that were provided because I'm preaching your word. That's my son. And, and even in this moment as I'm sitting here, that's God just, just hitting me. That was an amen from heaven. to call 13 different organizations that had booked me to come speak at their arenas, at their conferences, at all of their stuff. I, I had to call them and tell them I can't come. And they said, why? I said, because my wife needs me, my son needs me, and my church needs me.
And the reason I'm telling you this is, I appreciate that. That, that means the world to me. I'm, but I'm not telling you that for this because because every day I have to choose to take opportunities and not let the opportunities that come fumble what God has created me to actually do, which is obey him. Opportunity is nothing without obedience. Let me prove it to you. Have you ever heard that scripture that says obedience is better than sacrifice? Y'all don't even know where it is. That's in this story. Let me prove it to you. 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 22. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? It may not be popular what God is asking you to do. But your obedience will produce the promise that he has for your life. Look what it goes on to say. It says, listen, obedience is better than any sacrifice. And let me go a step further. And submission or being sub to the mission is better than offering the fat of rams. Check this out. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. Now, y'all. Y'all need, need to see that when you're disobedient to something you know God says, he considers it witchcraft. Some of y'all are like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm not going to be. Check the next verse. And stubbornness <laughs> is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. See, this is the whole thing that you need to understand. God wasn't trying to keep something from Saul. He wasn't trying to keep opportunities from Saul. He was trying to prepare him for more opportunities. And you need to know that some of you have been hasty. You've been doing things outside of the will of God. And God is coming to you today to say, slow down. Don't have hasty faith. Don't, don't, don't move and fumble over these moments often. But crazy faith has FOMO too. It's my last one. Crazy faith faithfully obtains more oil. Do, do, do y'all realize that Saul was anointed to be king? Samuel put oil on Saul's head and said, you are going to be a king that does so many things. And what God wanted to happen is he wanted him to wait there. So that Saul was anointed to fight this new battle. And the seventh day came and he was like, no, I see people sleeping, slipping away. I see people leaving. I'm going to do this. Everybody say myself. And some of y'all are at that point. Anointing the oil, all it means is God's approval. And all that God wanted Saul to do is to wait for him so he could have his approval. God's not trying to keep you from the job. He's not trying to keep you from that new city. He's not trying to keep you from that new permission, um, promotion. He just wants you to have his approval on it. And so because Saul forfeited, God had to find somebody else. And do you know the first thing that God did when, when they found David? Samuel brought him into a room with all of his brothers and he poured what on him? Oil. And what God is saying to many of you is that what God wants to do in your life may be something that is not a spectacle in front of everybody. But it may be the thing that gives you more oil, more approval to do it at a larger scale. At a larger scale. David would go on to do triple what Saul ever did. Because he was obedient and he had God's approval on him. So what are you saying for us to do? Pastor Mike, I want you to F it. Some of you dirty mind people. I want you to everybody say flip it. If you have had hasty faith and you've been working on FOMO, I want you to say flip it. I don't know. I, I, I just feel that there are some people in here that are going to admit that you've had FOMO. You've had fear of meeting opposition. But today we're going to everybody say flip it. 
you're going to have faith to murder opposition. When something comes your way, when things are trying to present itself as a giant to you, you're going to know that this is the thing that God wants to give me victory in. Somebody say flip it. If you've been one who forgets orders and makes options, you've been doing your own thing. It's time to. Y'all come on, help me. It's time to. We're going to flip it and we're going to have the faith to follow orders and maintain obedience. It's hard, but I'm going to obey. It's frustrating, but I'm going to obey. My friends are leaving, but I'm going to obey. I'm going to keep serving in the parking lot. I'm going to keep taking that woman to get groceries every week. I'm going to keep picking up my friend to be able to go to work. They, they ain't even giving me no gas money. It's hard. But I'm not doing this as unto you. This was the orders God gave me. And I'm about to flip everything that has been FOMO and has been hasty to the thing that is crazy and the thing that's going to get me to obtain the promise of God. Everybody shout at me, flip it. This is the time where people who've been having feelings and putting feelings over their obedience, it's time to flip it. You're going to decide to have faith over opinions. Pastor Mike, what are you saying? This, week gonna work, this word is going to work on you all week. Because you're going to have opportunities to walk in hasty faith. And God's just going to just remind you, flip it. Somebody say flip it. I don't know, I hear, I think it was uh, Prophet Scrappy. Flip, flip, flip. No, no, I don't know. <laughs> and if you're in this room and you've been one who fumbles obvious moments often, that God keeps giving you chance after chance to get it right, stay out of that relationship. Don't go back, well, I just like bad boys. Just stop. Well, I just want to be more successful. And God said, I have everything. I have everything for you at the time that it's supposed to happen. Flip it and be one who is faithfully obtaining more oil. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? Do you know that right after I canceled all those engagements and I flipped, like I flipped what, what I could have done? No, when God told me to cancel all my engagements, that could have been between me and God and I could have disobeyed. And my wife wouldn't have known. Y'all wouldn't have known. And I could have acted on like, God is blessing. I'm walking in his grace and his favor. Just disobedient as all get out. And it had nothing to do with you, but it would have affected you. See, your obedience is not isolated to you. Your obedience and disobedience affects everyone connected to you. Do y'all know 30 days after I made the decision in my heart, I hadn't even called all the people yet. But God knew I had done it in my heart. That's when we closed on this building. And can't nobody tell me, no, that it was what I obeyed God to do when nobody was looking. That qualified us for what God was going to use to touch the whole world. What's on the other side of you believing God in crazy faith? What's on the other side of you stepping out of hasty faith in FOMO and flipping it? Everybody say flip it. And you flip it into crazy faith FOMO. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? 2 Peter 3, 9. The only reason that you're being hasty is because you feel like you're missing out on something. But Samuel didn't come right at the moment Saul wanted him to, and sometimes God doesn't come right at the moment that you want him to for one specific reason. Look at it. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. Some of y'all think that, but it's not like that. Nope. He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everybody to repent. Today in this place, I think there's so many of us that need to repent for moving out of God's timing, thinking that he didn't have a plan for us, thinking that he was being slow on his promises. He said, I was being patient. I wanted you to get your attitude in order before I did that. 
I, I wanted to change your heart about that situation so you could see the perspective the right way. He said, I'm not being slow, I'm being patient. And today there are things that you've made decisions on, your opinions and options and all these other things. And God says, hey, we can start this whole thing over if you would just, everybody say, repent. If you're in this room and you've been dealing in hasty faith in any way and having FOMO, you, you've been having, having these areas of your life where you know you've been going outside the timing of God, I'm asking you to do something bold right now. I'm asking you to just stand up all over this place. I want to pray for you. If you know that you need to repent, and I know this is not for everybody because everybody's heart's not ready. Some of y'all is going to hit on Thursday. Some of y'all is going to hit next Sunday. But there's been an area of your life, and it's not your whole life, just an area where there's been a part of you that's moving outside of the time and of God, being anxious over all the opportunities, but not really remembering that God has a plan for you. I'm so proud of every person who's standing up right now who's really repenting right now because the worst thing for you to ever have happened to you is that God get FOMO about you. That God would find one more obedient. That's what David was. He was just a person that was more obedient than Saul. And God had to raise up somebody else because Saul wouldn't just wait on God hands lifted all over this place. If you're watching online, I want your hands lifted. We're going to pray that the spirit of FOMO would break off of your life in every area. Father, I thank you that in this place right now, you have people here, Father God, who are saying, I repent. Father, you haven't been slow. You've been patient with us. And God, for every person who has had fear of meeting opposition, I thank you, Father, that they know that they are winning because you are on their side. And if God be for them, who can be against them? I pray for every person who has forgotten orders, Father, and have made their own options up. Father, I thank you that they would stay true to the words that you have spoken, Father, and follow the orders that you have given. Father, I thank you for every person who has put their feelings, Father God, over their obedience. I'm declaring right now that we would obey your word more than what we feel. And Father God, for those of us who have continually fumbled your grace, and we've done it over and over again, today we're saying it's over. And today, God, we're asking you forgive us. We will not move outside of the timing of God anymore. We're going to have crazy faith to believe you like never before. And I declare that there are victories coming in everybody's life right now as we are believing and we are standing and we are waiting on the promises of God.